it was Easter Sunday when we were, I presume, I, I, you may have been celebrating the birth of Jesus, but I'm, I'm guessing that you were probably celebrating and remembering the fact that Jesus didn't just die, but he rose again and is alive, and he gave his life um, for us. But although he died on that cross, the most horrific death, death could not hold him. And he rose again and is alive today. And this morning, I want to help us try and think a little bit about the implications of that. And we're going to do that by looking at a passage um, in the Bible from John chapter 21. We are going to try and think about the good news uh, that the risen Lord Jesus transforms everything. And I've called this Reconciliation, Restoration, and transformation. And the exciting thing is that as we sit here in this ordinary place, us very ordinary people, we sit here with the very extraordinary, risen Lord Jesus amongst us, wanting to work in our lives. And because he's alive and working today, whoever you are, he sees where you're at. And he loves you, no matter what's gone on in your life. He loves you. And he wants to meet you right where you're at. He wants to speak into your life where it is. He's not waiting for you to go, oh, I've got to do this, 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 and then. No. Do you know what? In his love, he sees where you're at. He sees what's going on in your life. And he wants to speak to you. And today, my prayer is that what, whoever you are, whether you've been a Christian for years and years and years, and you've been coming for, oh, I've been talking to someone today who's been here for, I think from the maths they gave me, over 48 years or something like that, roughly. Um, or you're just here for the first time, and I've also been talking to someone who's here for the very first time. And what a privilege to have people, that are, you know, a whole mix of people. And do you know what? The risen Lord Jesus loves you and wants to meet you right where you're at. And maybe what's happened is along the way, somehow you feel like you've lost that reality of relationship with him. Maybe you're just aware of stuff that's gone, you haven't got right, it's gone wrong, and you feel like there's a barrier between you and him. Well, the risen Lord Jesus wants to come and deal with all of that and bring reconciliation and restoration. Whatever may have happened in your life, he wants to bring about incredible restoration and ongoing transformation. He wants to keep working in us and through us, changing us. And so we're going to read this story um, in a moment. And um, basically, it's the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples and after he's risen from the dead. Um, and it, I think this is like a key stepping stone from John chapter 18 to Acts chapter 2. Now, some of you may go, what on earth are you on about there? Stepping stone from John 18 to Acts chapter 2. Well, if you went back, and we're not going to do it, but if you went back and looked at John chapter 18, you would see there, this is before Jesus come to the cross. And in the lead up to that, um, Jesus says to his disciples, you're all going to walk away from me. You're all going to leave me. And Peter goes, never. I'll never do that. And, um, and Jesus says, um, do you know what? Before the cock crows three times. Sorry, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. He goes, no, no, I could never do that. And then what happens in John 18, we see exactly that happen. When Jesus is arrested, someone says, oh, you knew him, didn't you? You were with him. No, 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 I never knew him. Three times, he denies him blatantly. And then the cock crows. And you and I can only imagine quite what he felt at that moment when he's like, oh, exactly what he said has happened. This, this man that I said I'd follow no matter what, First moment, I've let him down. 
And that sense of failure was probably very real. And yet, if you go from John 18, where he's like, oh no, I never knew him, and you're in Acts chapter 2, you see him standing in front of thousands of people and boldly declaring the fact that Jesus died on the cross and sharing the gospel. You go, wow, is this the same person? How has he gone from there, from zero to hero? What on earth has happened? Well, one of the things that's happened, there's a few significant things that have happened. Jesus has died and risen again. That is pretty significant. In the start of Acts chapter 2, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. But also, I think just as significant is a very real personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. Through a real, authentic, and personal encounter, everything changes for Peter. And God is always wanting to do a work of restoration and recommissioning. And before we read these verses, I'm just going to ask Em if she would just come and share just a little bit of her story, just to to illustrate this a little bit. Does it matter where I stand? No. Okay. Is it turned on? I don't know. Is it? Okay, great. I've taken my glasses off because you're not so scary when you're a bit blurry. (laughs) Um, So, uh, Andy and I have very different backgrounds, so I didn't grow up in a Christian house or anything like that, or a Christian home. I'm a first-generation Christian, and I really, my faith came alive for me when I went to university. I had four years where I um, lived as a Christian, I was part of the Christian Union, part of church, baptized in the Holy Spirit, kind of going for it by, to all intents and purposes. Um, and after that four years, I, I went home, I'd been a, away from home for most of that time, and my family uh, just fell apart. My dad, just out of the blue, he left a note, and he, he wasn't there when we got back from the shopping with my mum one day, and he said he didn't love her anymore in this note, and she's never seen him since. And uh, our family kind of spiraled, and I didn't really have a church back home. And I spiraled, and I spent the next five years looking for love in all the wrong places, hurting, and generally being a bit of a wild child. And if you'd seen me on the outside, I just, like people would say, oh, you're so free, you're such a wild child. But actually what it was was me kind of self-healing with alcohol and sleeping around a bit. And what other people saw as, as me being a wild child was just me hurting. But I spent that five or six years just living very differently to how I knew a Christian should live. I could never deny there was a God. So if anyone talked to me about Jesus, I, I could say, yeah, he's real and he loves you. And If I was scared, I could pray in tongues. God never turned his back on me, but I had turned my back on him in the midst of all my hurt. And one day I was in work. I was very, very, um, what's the word, oversharing. So I was there bragging about what I'd been up to the night before. And probably the first bit of hardness of heart was just beginning. And I said, all I need now is for a Christian to walk in. And this bloke walked in and I turned around and I said, now you're going to tell me you're a Christian. And he just went like this. How did you know? And at that point, I thought that maybe God was still interested. Because I was aware that I was dirty. I was soiled goods is a word I used to describe myself to a friend who I went to see. So God was on my case. I kind of knew it, and I arranged to reconnect with a Christian friend. And over the few days, I stayed with a friend of his, and we talked, and he asked some very direct questions. We'd known each other for quite a while. And uh, actually, I just ended up making, having breakfast with the lady I was staying with, saying, will you pray for me? I need to come back to Jesus. And I came back to him. And what happened was immediately as I turned back, he met me. And it was like 
a veil was, taught, was, was, was put over the last five years, and it was almost as if I'd never been away. That moment of reconciliation. And then while I was there, I was about to go back in my car, and my car broke down. It was a, it was a bit of a problem, that car. And the radiator needed replacing and all the rest of it. And it was such a nightmare. And in that process, I think God did that to my car. <laughs> because I had to stay then with some people I hadn't met for a while. They offered me a place to stay. They mended my car because he was a mechanic. And I stayed for another couple of days. And during that time, I reconnected with, a, with some Christian friends. And it was like he'd restored friendship just like that in the space of a couple of days and then I went back to Plymouth and I knew I needed to go to church <laughs> but I was really really determined that I was not going to change anything about myself now if you had known me back then every other word was the F word for the majority of my time in Plymouth and um, I was determined I wasn't going to change my language and I wasn't going to change the way I lived unless God told me to. Because I didn't want to live in rules. I just wanted to live real before him. And so when I went back to church, I joined a church. didn't know anyone. It was a little bit... My mum's not Christian, but she came with me because she was like, well, you can't, I can't let you go on your own. Um, I was uncomfortable to have in church because... I was just very thoroughly me, and I was not playing like I should play. I wasn't behaving like I should behave, and they were so welcoming. And what happened was I experienced not the rules of behavior, but the grace of God, as people just loved me back into his kingdom. And I made friends with people, and they didn't talk like I talked. Praise the Lord. <laughs> But actually what happened was I changed incrementally. And I did start to change my behavior. And I, you know what? It wasn't plain sailing. <laughs> you know, there were times when I was hurt and I'd, I'd do things that I shouldn't do and behave in ways that I shouldn't have behaved. But I experienced his love and his grace and transformation happened. And it, maybe it didn't happen as fast as some people would have liked it to. <laughs> me included, but it happened. The first two, reconciliation and restoration, they were really fast. Transformation took more time, but he was about his business in me. And I'm so grateful for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you sharing because it just hopefully helps to land it in a personal way and the truth is Jesus is alive and wanting to do that sort of work you know and not all of us will have the same story as Emma but he wants to meet us where we're at and he wants to work in our lives and so let's just see how we see this unfolding in John chapter 21 um, it says verse 1 afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Galilee it happens this way. Um, actually, it, it will be, yeah, it will be on the. Thank you. Um, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. And just before we go on, it's probably worth just saying a couple of things. Um, first thing is, uh, we, we don't know for certain what was in Peter's mind when he was going back to fish. But what we do know is, when he decided to follow Jesus, he walked away from his nets. He, they left their nets and followed him. And I don't know, just in his sense of failure, whether he's thinking, well, I'm no good now. I can't, you know, that call that I accepted from Jesus, I can't. I can't have that, so I might as well go back to fishing. We can't fully know, but he was going back to something. And um, 
and as he fished on his own, they caught nothing. And the truth is that life, ministry, or mission on our own leads to nothing. Um, But the risen Lord Jesus is watching and waiting to help. Verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. So we see here how Jesus is watching and waiting to help. The risen Lord Jesus is always wanting to engage and speak into our everyday lives. And, of course, what he hopes is that we will welcome his involvement and obey his instruction. That we won't just say, no, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to do it without you. But we'll actually say, you're alive, why not have you with me in the midst of all that I'm doing and all that's going on in life? I don't want to do this on my own. You know best. I'm going to try and listen to you. I'm going to try and do things your way. And the truth is that failure, and, you know, I don't have to be a prophet to know that in this room, you know, this number of people, etc., etc., some, well, just know, all of us, we go through, we make mistakes, we get things wrong, we fail, we fall down. We have all done that. And it may well be that you're in this room today and you're aware of stuff, oh, God, what have I done? Failure is not a reason to run from him, but a reason to run to him. Failure is not a reason to run from him, but a reason to run to him. Peter had unresolved business to sort. And when John says to him, it's the Lord, suddenly he can't wait. He's jumping out of the boat and he's running straight to Jesus. Why? Because he knows there's stuff that I need to get sorted out. Do you, do you, sometimes have you been in that place? Many of us that have been married for any length of time, there's stuff that goes on. You go, do you know what? We just need to get this sorted out. And w- until it's sorted, it's not quite right. You know, come on, let's get it sorted. And the risen Lord Jesus is always wanting, if there's unresolved stuff, he doesn't want us to leave it unresolved. He wants to help us to face it. Verse 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and we'll come back to that, there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged, dragged even the net ashore. It was a full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, I love this, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And here we see Jesus' utter commitment to relationship. He talks with us and invites us to be with him and to eat with him. 
truth is that having a meal with someone is not so much about getting some food inside you. Having a meal with someone is an invitation to relationship. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. Whatever's gone on, he's inviting Peter, he's inviting the disciples, and they've all said, no, you know, they've all left him, as it were. He's inviting them into relationship. When um, I was um, uh, 11 years old, I'd um, grown up in a Christian home. It was a real privilege. I saw uh, real faith in my mum and dad. But I was about this sort of start. I was went to, used to go to church with them. And then when I was about 11, I began to think, oh, is church a bit boring? Oh, do I really want to go? And, um, and I was really into sports. And so they encouraged me to think about going on this camp. And um, I said, oh, look, there's this sports camp. It's a Christian sports camp. Why don't you go on it? So I went on it, and I loved it. I had the most amazing time, all sorts of activities and sports and different things going on. And then each morning and evening, there were little talks. And I have to say, it was like it just grabbed me because they basically just very clearly and simply went through the gospel. And morning and evening, it began to grip me in a way that somehow sitting with my mum and dad in church hadn't quite, wasn't quite having that effect. It's like, oh, suddenly it felt personal. And in particular, I look back on a really significant night where someone spoke on the verses in Revelation chapter 3. And um, Revelation 3, 19 to 20, they're often spoken, I mean, to be honest, it was written to Christians, but, but, but actually, you know, for me, it was quite personal as someone who hadn't yet made a decision to respond to the invitation of Jesus. Um, and verse 19 says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, Jesus says. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. And as an 11-year-old on that camp, I always remember this person talking about this verse and then putting up a picture, many of you may have seen it, a picture that was painted by Holman Hunt of Jesus standing outside this rather overgrown door and with a crown of thorns on his head and a light as the a little lamp as the light of the world and he's knocking. And the guy who was talking that night said, and do you know what, when Holman Hunt had finished his painting, he took it to a friend of his and he said, what do you think of it? And the friend said, oh, it's amazing, Holman. It's absolutely brilliant. I was an 11-year-old. I'm right there. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's a really good picture. He said, but you've made one mistake. And Holman Hunt goes, oh, no, what's that? And I'm thinking, oh, no, what was that? And um, he said, you haven't put a handle on the door. And apparently Holman Hunt said, oh, no, that's not a mistake. Because the handle's on the inside in that Jesus is a gentleman. And in his love and his grace, he continues to knock, wanting to come in to be a part of our lives, wanting to be in a living, ongoing, real relationship with us. But he doesn't force his way in. He waits to be welcomed. And as an 11-year-old, I remember going, well, I've never opened that door. I've never turned that handle. And I... I want to do that. And I went up to my room that night, and beside my bed, I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you died for me. I recognize that you lovely, love me, that you want to be a part of my life, and I want to welcome you into my life. And I look back on that moment as a defining moment, as a moment when relationship with him started, when he came into my life in a real way. And that's what he wants for each and every one of us. He's alive. Not so we might just remember on Easter Sunday one time, Jesus is alive, let's sing a few lively songs. No, because he, actually, because he's alive, we can know him. We can talk to him. We can have relationship with him. And that's what he wants for each and every one of us. 
verse 15 says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And the risen Lord Jesus loves to come alongside us and help us face the past, to free us from our guilt and to invite us, what an amazing privilege, into his work. That's what he does. Whoever you are here today, he wants to come and if there's stuff that's not right, stuff that's unresolved, he wants to help you to face it and you know what? He's got plans and purposes for you. He wants to invite you into his work to be involved in all that he's doing in our world today. And so what do we need to do? We need to let him help us face the past, embrace his freedom, and begin to serve him again. Jesus wants to help Peter face what happened so that instead of living in the shadow of his shame, he could forever live in the light of God's grace and freedom and fulfill the destiny on his life. Jesus wants to help Peter face it. And he wants to help us face our past so that he can forgive us for our past and free us from it so that we're free to step into the destiny that he has for us. And you see, what he doesn't do is he doesn't just pretend that it's not happened, that it's not there. He does want to get real. He does want us to help us to face it. I don't think it's by accident that Jesus comes and meets Peter on a boat, fishing, just in the context where he first met him that first time and called him to follow him. I don't think it's by accident that we read that there were burning, a fire of burning coal. That Greek word, I'm no Greek scholar, but that Greek word is anthrakia, and it's only used one other time, and it's in John 18. It's where, at the moment, that Peter denies Jesus. It says he's warming himself by a fire of burning coal. It's the same word that's used. And what is happening... Jesus is bringing Peter. He's making sure he faces what has gone on. He doesn't just push it under the carpet and pretend it hasn't happened because then stuff doesn't really get resolved. He's wanting to be real with it. So many people live with shallow relationships because they don't face stuff. And they pretend and it all becomes just superficial. That's no good. Jesus wants deep, real, authentic relationship with us. And therefore, he wants to help us face things that we need to face. Years ago, um, I went to visit um, someone in their house. And um, it was one of those houses that are just, um, you know, everything is just, just in its perfect place. And um, you may have got the impression from the fact that Emma said what we need to do if um, King Charles was visiting our house. was, If you come to our house, I would describe it as a lived-in house. And... Um, we have lots of people in and out the house, and um, it's, it's well lived in. Well, this house I was going to go and see these people in was at a whole level of, of cleanliness and order 
that um, was beyond my, my, what I'm used to, and, um, or certainly was used to. And um, so I go and um, arrive at the, um, the door and um, uh, knock on the door, and they welcome me in very warmly, which is nice, and, um, and they take me into their perfect sitting room and, um, and ask me if I'd like a drink, and I go, oh, yeah, please, and whatever drink I ask for. They both went into the kitchen to prepare the drinks, and I'm left in this perfect living room with this cream white carpet, and I'm walking around thinking, where shall I sit where I will make least, you know, least mess up their very ordered, clean room? And as I walk around on this cream white carpet, suddenly, to my horror, I realize I've brought in a whole lot of dog's muck. And it's like, no! No, 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 no! And, and they're in the kitchen just next door. I know they're coming back. So, and, and so I'm thinking, what can I do? And I'm trying to get my foot, and I'm trying to sort of see if I can manage to lift it back up again. And all it's doing is not helping. And I'm thinking, ah, can I, shall I just somehow, is there a sofa that I can somehow just get and push it over and hide it? And of course, they came back in, and there was nothing I could do. All I could do is say, look, I'm really, really sorry, but um, I brought in a whole lot of mess. And, um, and they were very gracious and, um, and, and just said, oh, that's fine. And they got some, went and got some stuff and sorted it out. And before you know it, it was totally sorted. And I can sit down and have a nice conversation with them, not sit there thinking, oh, no, what? Um, there is a real danger that we can want to bury stuff, hide stuff, push stuff under the carpet. Jesus, in his love, wants something much more for us than that. Not just superficial, shallow relationship, but real, authentic relationship. And so he, in his love, will bring us back to stuff that is unresolved. Stuff that he wants to help us to face so that we can genuinely move beyond it. His relationship with Jesus, Peter's relationship with Jesus, would never have been the same had they not genuinely faced that and been able to move beyond it. And he asked him three times, do you love me? Because this is right at the root and the heart of everything. Love for God. It's the great commandment, isn't it? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And, um, and then as he affirms his love for Jesus, the one who has invited him back into a relationship, the one that's helping him face the past, and pointing him to a future, Jesus calls him afresh into his work. Jesus, the good shepherd, invites Peter afresh into his work of feeding and caring for the sheep. An amazing act of forgiveness, grace, and trust. And this side of Easter, we have the privilege of knowing that through the cross, through the cross, Christ's call trumps our fall. Whatever mistakes we've made, through the cross, there is forgiveness that's available. And we can be invited back into his work. And maybe you're here and you've thought, oh, I've messed up. Oh, he can't use me. Oh, no, I might as well just get on and live the way I lived in the past. There's just not much point. I might as well give up. Jesus, in his love, speaks to you today, sees you where you're at, and he wants to help you face that he, so that he can forgive you and free you to step into the destiny that he has for you. And finally, he invites us to lay down our lives and to follow him. Verse 18, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, and remember, now Jesus has already gone to the cross, follow me. Peter turned 
and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. I wonder if we are in danger of getting caught up with other people's walk, other people's race. What about them? Instead of the race that he's marked out for us. He has a destiny, a plan, a purpose for each of our lives. We're not the same. Praise God. He will want to use you differently to the way he uses me, and vice versa. And sometimes we get too caught up with other people. And Peter's about to go, well, you know, so you're saying that to me, but what about him then? Jesus doesn't want him to be caught up with me. That's, forget that. You follow me. And there is a different backdrop to this conversation because he's invited Peter to follow him before. But there's a different backdrop now. And that backdrop is Peter's failure. He's very aware of his fallibility. He's very aware of his humanness. He's very aware of his failure. But he's also aware of Christ's sacrifice. That Jesus has gone to the cross, died and risen again. And do you know what? The only way we will live the lives that he really intends us to live is when we're focused on Jesus. When we look at him and we are inspired by him. The writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 12 put it this way. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. There's a race that's been marked out for you. And maybe you've made mistakes. And maybe you've got stuff wrong. Maybe you've got caught up in religion rather than relationship. Well, today, the risen Lord Jesus, in his love, wants to come, come right alongside each and every one of us. He's watching, he's waiting, he sees us and he wants to speak into our lives. And whoever you are, I want to encourage you, don't settle for religion. Understand that he invites you into a real relationship. Don't settle for life without him but invite him into every aspect of your life. And don't live with guilt and shame. But know that in his love, he wants to forgive you and free you. That you can step into his God-given destiny. Don't look at other people's races Understand you've got a unique call and the way you can live that is by fixing your eyes on him, by remembering what he has done. When he even died on a cross. And for me there are times when I face some really difficult challenges in my life and there's times when I've just wanted to give up and I'm very grateful that at some of those moments in the grace of God, he's brought me back to reflect on the fact that whatever I'm going through, it's nothing compared to what Jesus went through when he died on the cross. 
Maybe I can pray. The rest of his life, Peter is able to face the past and to accept Christ's invitation to lay down his life and to follow him afresh. And now it's not from a place of guilt, but a place of gratitude. Not from a place of despair, but a place of dependence. Not from a place of regret, but reconciliation and restoration. And Lord Jesus, in this moment, we want to thank you that you are here, living Lord Jesus, right now. In your love, you see what's going on in each and every one of our lives. And instead of turning away, you reach out. And I pray, Father, that you would help each and every one of us not to run from you, no matter what's gone on in our lives, not to run from you, but to run to you. To welcome that authentic, real, honest relationship. Thank you for the plans and purposes you have for our lives. And I pray that none of us would miss what you've got for us by going back to an old way of living but we'd respond to that invitation and welcome you into every aspect of our lives. Forgive us, free us, and help us to step into that destiny that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.